Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, welcome to this session. And my name is Elizabeth Lule, and I'm the Executive Director of the Early Childhood Development Action Network. And I have the honor of uh, leading a global platform that coordinates more than 300 partners. Uh, we advocate, uh, we uh, share knowledge and learning, and we also connect and we promote collective action. As we had this morning, no one can do everything that we need to do to address complex um, issues, so it is partnerships. So we are here today to lift up the needs of children uh, at COP28. This is important because we know children, especially young children, are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and will disproportionately be at the brunt of climate crisis. We had about one billion children are affected. We also know that children needs are not adequately represented in the climate negotiations and financing. And it is shocking, in fact, that in the last more than 30 years since the UN FCC was adopted, there has never been a decision dedicated to protecting children. This is unacceptable, and we are here to change it together. In this session, we will have opening remarks uh, followed by a rich panel uh, discussion and by a presentation of some interesting technological assets that are out there. It is the age of technology, and we are way behind, so we will be happy to learn from that. So with that, uh, please allow me to introduce our distinguished um, speakers uh, for the opening. And I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. George uh, Larian Ajay, to speak on behalf uh, of UNICEF, and he's the director of uh, global programming. Welcome, Dr. George. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Kitty van, de van Hagen, who was here a few minutes ago, but I started to rush to the Bulgaria Pavilion. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, ECD is very important to me, and, and I, I applaud Egdan for the work they are doing. Perhaps to start also by, by paying tribute to, to bikers for their commitment to ECD, and um, helping us all to go the way of ensuring um, um, that ECD um, strategies get into whatever plans emerge in relation to adaptation. UNICEF is committed to support implementation of the Dubai Declaration, which calls world leaders to take action uh, for young children. Uh, um, I think this science has become quite clear about what happens to young children um, due to climate impacts. We see that right from conception, heat stress, and it's, it's direct link with preterm births. We see that even after Delivery, the health of the mother is compromised, breast milk for, for formation is compromised due to heat stress. We know the signs now that uh, young children breathe faster than those of us in this room. They breathe twice the rate of those of us in this room. So imagine you, are, you live in a polluted environment that indeed compromises your health right from the, from the early, early years. We also see the stress that, come, that, have not, that are coming on, on parents now due to climate impacts and, and the need to, 
support p parents in a different way, in a bigger way. So the time is, is now for all of us to act. The time is now for all of us to act through um, our, our, our mainstream our approaches, but getting governments, interna international community to prioritize the early years, in especially in the adaptation strategies. But also, as, as, as partners look at issues around air pollution, solutions to these, we need um, partners to prioritize the impact on young children. In UNICEF, we are stepping up our, our, our work in this area. We, we've done so in the last couple of years to understand the science. And now we are, we're now trying to reprogram a lot of our actions in this direction. How do we join hands with many of you to strengthen resilience and continuity of social services prohibition? How do we provide immediate support when a crisis hits so a mother and young children don't have to relocate, don't have to move into a camp, don't have to move to and fro um, as crisis um, 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 in, in, in increase? How do we work with governments to ensure that these, are st these, these matters are st central in their own NDCs, in their own, in, in their own plans? And how do we ensure that language here at COP, as we, we, are, um, we are in, in, in the middle of the negotiations, there's strong language on the health and well-being of children, especially young children. So we are looking forward to, to joining hands with, with all of you. And, and, and we think the time is now. We need to um, speak out some more for young children, and we need to ensure that they are, they are, their needs are prioritized in plans. So with that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, I'm hand over and thank you for coming. And, and, and um, at some stage, I'll, I'll have to st st step out uh, um, for, for another event, but my colleagues are here to join in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, George, Larry, and Ajay for those um, uh, welcoming remarks, but also for framing the issue that we need to address. And with that, let me also go ahead uh, and invite our panel um, and welcome them to the floor. Um, given that we are so behind, I think we have to be flexible. I'm not even quite sure which of the ministers have been called away. But uh, I just wanted to check if the Honorable Deputy Chairman of the Cabinet of Ministers for the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Mr. Edeo Basilova, is here and welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Education from Malawi, uh, Ms. Mandaliso Wirema, welcome. Ms. Gilly, Gillian Coldwell, Chief uh, Climate Officer and Deputy Assistant Administrator with USAID. Welcome. And I'm particularly happy to welcome Francisco Vera to the floor, a UNICEF Youth Advocate from Colombia. Welcome. So, Honorable Deputy Chairman of the Cabinet of Ministers of the Kyrgyz Republic, so far we have heard about the disproportionate impact of climate change has on young children from UNICEF. We've also discussed how investments in early childhood and foundational learning will yield uh, improved outcomes in health, education, and economic development while also building climate resilience. So, Honorable Minister, can you tell us what investments you're making in young children in Kyrgyz Republic as a means for addressing climate change, and how do you empower children uh, to engage in climate action and advocacy? Over to you, Honorable Minister. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, UNICEF, uh, Dubai Cares, and all other organizers for putting together this very important panel. I spoke at the opening plenary of the Rewired. And, uh, and of course, we are, as national delegations, we are having many, many engagements with 190 countries uh, taking part in COP uh, to make sure that our children do not face the dire consequences of our actions and actions of previous generations. I think it would be unfair to put the burden on our children. Uh, children must, of course, grow up by having new skills, new skills, new outlooks, and uh, unfortunately, this is the way it is, that our lifestyle, the lifestyle that our parents have enjoyed is not going to be accessible to our children, although, you know, there are some regions in this world who are going to celebrate warmer weather, uh, and, uh, you know, there are some uh, fruits that are going to start growing in some places that were not uh, growing before. And, of course, it will come uh, uh, as some other countries will experience much harsher weather and everything. But I would like to say uh, on behalf of uh, my own government and I think of the national delegations taking part at COP that we should not put the burden on our children. And we should make everything so that we could, can, uh, we we that we could uh, to avert the worst. And of course, that's why we are having meetings uh, every half an hour and I had to walk all the way back. <laughs> 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 but anyways, but I think this, is this panel is very important. And of course, uh, I uh, had words with Francesca. Francesca is 13 years old. Uh, but, um, and I think about children back home who we are going to discuss at uh, side events and other, uh, how we're going to change the curriculum, how we're going to change uh, the resources, the training to that we put into our teachers. Uh, and uh, it's not about the skills, I'm repeating myself, but I think the children are the best uh, change makers in terms of that they influence their parents. I can tell it, uh, say it as a, as a parent myself. Mm. I've picked up many skills. I've picked up many uh, changes in my behavior because my daughter had insisted because that's what she heard in a kindergarten. That's what she heard in, in elementary. That's what they pass as uh, the most influencers, the most impact that they have is talking to our children in organized schools and doing the propaganda. And uh, some people will call it mm, uh, some uh, uh, wo worse names, but we need to influence our own societies uh, via children. And of course, we are going to apologize to our children for the future that we are uh, going to put them uh, uh, through. Thank, thank you, you so much. Honorable Minister, and uh, I want to thank you for your leadership and also um, the investments that you're making. But also on a personal level, I'd like to thank you also for having participated in uh, a community of practice as part of peer learning uh, through UNICEF um, and other partners. And we hope to continue to learn from the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. Now let's go to Africa. <laughs> Um, Honorable Minister Wirima, in Malawi, you have seen the impact of climate change firsthand, where Cyclone Freddy uh, caused deadly flooding and landslides mm. that claimed thousands of lives. And I personally saw the early childhood development centers being washed away. Uh, many of the affected were children and their caregivers. So knowing that the children are the most vulnerable for these sorts of extreme weather events, what investments are needed and what investments are you making to ensure that our youngest children are better protected from the impact of climate change? And what message would you like to send to the conference negotiators? And I know you're already working with some of uh, our coalition members on the appropriate language to include. 
Over to you, Honorable Minister. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good afternoon. So you have done my opening already because you did already uh, mention what the country, Malawi, has experienced due to um, the climatic uh, change. We've had um, serious weather shocks that um, not only have um, negatively impacted uh, the education sector, but also other sectors, um, health as well as uh, due to the same, to the shocks, we also experienced uh, um, waterborne diseases, an outbreak, chorella and other diseases. So uh, we have been set back. And uh, on the same, uh, from the effects, we even had um, most of our classrooms, whether the ones for um, early learning or the ones for just primary schools, being used um, as um, shelters for internally displaced people uh, for months on months and uh, disturbing learning in the process because we just had to make sure that the people that were in those affected areas also had um, places to be in. Um, distinguished guests, uh, we need to climate proof the education sector and accelerate climate resilient and climate smart education investments and actions. Climate re related disasters are interrupting children's education across the board, ac I'm sorry, across the globe. This is why Mal in Malawi, we are carrying out several strategic interventions, including one, investing in climate responsive standards for school infrastructure, training school communities to prepare and implement disaster risk management strategies. We are also investing in alternative education modalities that ensure children continue learning despite disasters and disruptions and integrating disaster risk management and related climate change issues into system strengthening and education planning. Um, we need to invest in strengthening systems to effectively develop and implement climate change policies, strategies aclo across the sectors, ensuring a clear link to issues of early childhood learning and foundational learning. We need also to invest in creating climate resilient communities through strengthening climate specific education and training in schools and early childhood development centers in combination with public awareness of climate change and its effects. We have a clear responsibility together to invest in scalable and implementable climate change initiatives, ensuring among other things that early childhood and primary school environments and workforce are provided with the necessary tools essential to promote climate change and learning. Despite progress made over the past years, there's still low investment in early childhood education and access falls below the half mark by one percentage point. Um, we, uh, so we, on our part, uh, please join me in calling on the chair of uh, COP28 to elevate, elevate in brackets, in courts, the topic of early childhood and education as a fundamental piece of climate, of climate, um, sorry, of climate resilience and adaptation. We also call on the parties of the UNFCC process to amend the mandates of financing mechanisms to recognize the importance of early childhood and education and allow for funding of programs focused on the youngest children and their families. You may have heard um, when my counterpart was talking, these are the same areas that he did mention. We cannot overemphasize the need for the right funding modalities. We can speak of um, having to equip our teachers, of having to equip even our young ones, because when we also train our kids early on to also be aware and to adapt and to do what's needful to make sure that we actually have the right mitigations for the climatic shocks, the climate change, this is where the gains are. But we can talk of these things over and over if we don't act by having the resources that we need. For example, I'm just saying in Malawi, we are now working on the foundational learning because um, this is where 
we have gone back to say, this is where we need to go back, going back to the basics. But if we don't have the resources to actually digitalize the, the, um, the e-learning, where most of the children can actually learn even using the tablet, if we can't offer school meals in most of the early primary schools or the ECDs, where we can actually increase access to education, but also to make sure that kids learn well and they stay in school, which needs resources, then we can't attain all these things, all these beautiful uh, strategies and plans that we keep speaking about. So it's time that we now move to action and to make sure that uh, these funding mechanisms, the resources that we've been asking for, are actually provided. We call on governments to ensure continuity of learning in the face of emergencies by investing in climate resilient infrastructure, which also needs resources, especially on our part and in our continent, and alternative teaching and learning modalities, ring, ring fencing, education financing, and protecting children affected by the climate crisis. This is why Malawi, with support from the GPE, is piloting the Climate Smart Education Program, together for better education outcomes. I thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Honorable Minister Wirima. Let's uh, give you a hand of applause, and thank you for the calls to action as well. So now shifting to the international perspective. Um, in the more than 30 years since the UNFCC was adopted, there has never been a, de a decision dedicated to protecting children. In addition, a recent study on climate financing, um, following up on what Honorable Minister Wirima just spoke about, only 2.4% of major multilateral climate funds support child responsive programs. We also heard about the shortage of funding. Uh, 75 uh, cents per child will not make it as we heard from uh, Professor Sachs uh, to support children in emergency. However, we are seeing promising shifts. There is always hope. <laughs> and uh, many government um, development agencies are starting to mainstream climate in their early childhood development and education strategies. And for USAID in particular, you have recently launched a new guidance on advancing climate action through education to support your missions and partners to integrate climate change considerations and to have smart, uh, climate smart education programs. Could you tell us about uh, USAID's vision for implementing this new guidance? And how can this guidance support early childhood development and education to ensure that children uh, have a more prominent role in climate change actions and financing. They are truly part of the solution. Over to you, Gillian. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to Dubai Cares and to UNICEF for organizing um, today's conversation. As you've mentioned, um, education is absolutely fundamental, as are children and youth. Um, who, of course, will shape the future. Um, and um, as was already noted, we owe them um, an enormous debt um, given the situation we currently find ourselves in when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, USAID has launched a whole of agency strategy to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and that means that whether you're working in democracy or biodiversity or um, humanitarian affairs or education, we want you to be thinking about what you can do to advance climate positive impacts. That's why we um, shaped the new technical guidance for our missions in 80 countries around the world focused on advancing climate resilient education. So it's a series of guidelines as to how to integrate um, climate, environment, water security, biodiversity, all of the related um, areas to improve educational outcomes. It's not just to equip um, children and youth for the future, um, but also to improve the educational outcomes because of course with our education funding, that is our primary responsibility according to the US Congress. And um, we're, we're being able to do that just by way of one example in um, Morocco, um, the Reading for Success program, which we coordinated with um, the Ministry of Education um, was able to implement a nationwide uh, program 
focused on integrating climate education into the primary school learning of students um, from grades one through six. And uh, we saw significant um, increases in reading capability as a result of that program. And I think that's because students are excited by the content. It's relevant to them and it motivates them to, to learn. Um, we've done similar work in Egypt um, with the Ministry of Education. So I think partnering, uh, governments partnering with other governments to um, ensure that even as children develop their literacy and their numeracy skills, they're doing it with content that's relevant to the world around them and that prepares them for the future is so important. Um, USAID's climate strategy also recognizes the critical importance of youth. Um, I think we wouldn't be where we are today in terms of at least the level of ambition that many governments are now demonstrating regarding climate action. We're obviously nowhere near where we need to be in terms of delivering on those commitments, but youth have been absolutely pivotal to demanding a future that's worthy of, of, of them and their energy. Um, so also through the strategy um, and our, our resourcing, we have a program called Youth Excel, which is really preparing youth to, um, to help shape the policy and the future that, that is theirs um, through data-driven information and understanding. Um, and I'm also pleased to announce that um, we are launching a new call for proposals um, with the UK government, FCDO, which is their um, development agency, called the Climate Action Partnership for Education, or CAPE. And um, this is really a focus on how we can integrate um, the sort of intersecting fields of climate, gender, and education. We're looking for uh, really catalytic systems changing interventions that will look at the nexus of those three terrains. And we expect to be making um, three, at least up to three grants in, in, the, next, um, in the next year to um, really advance that work. So um, we recognize the importance of, of youth and of children. And I think it's important to realize that it's not just about their um, educational outcomes, it's also recognizing the psychological and emotional impact of um, the world we face today. And they need support to, to navigate that as well which is why I'm really excited to hear what Francisco has to say, because you've had to listen to adults for far too long on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Ms. Goldwell. And uh, thank you for walking the talk of partnering uh, and working with other governments to grow the pie of financing that could be available to build the resilience that you talked about. But also thank you for recognizing that children, and in particular young children, are part of the solution and we can learn from them as much as they learn from us. And uh, Francisco, um, I'm so delighted that you are able to join uh, this panel. <laughs> and you're one of the youngest um, youth advocates I have seen uh, during this COP28. I've not seen many as young as you. So we are really interested to hear from you on the factors that allowed you to get here on this panel and also, what do you think governments need to do to ensure that children are equipped to deal with the climate crisis? Through your voice. Okay, thank you so much for the space for to, to tell you a little bit uh, from the view of, of the children. No, I think that uh, there is a phrase that says uh, we cannot uh, it's all about children without them. No, we mm. need them also to uh, bring their 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 experience their their opinions their commit their comments about the climate and about what we are doing re regarding the problem and the climate crisis so thank you for that um, and thank you UNICEF too for and the white cares for make the 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 event no for me uh, I mean the what has uh, taken me to uh, taking me here I think that is that I have been uh, involved in the climate activism during many time, uh, during long time ago, I have been a uh, activist for, for climate, mm. uh, for the environment, for the nature, for the children rights, because finally uh, what climate crisis uh, do, it's affect uh, the, the children rights and the children life, no? So 
Uh, I think that is mainly uh, because of, of that, of, of being uh, collaborating uh, to this uh, struggle for the climate and for the future. Finally, is the, it's, uh, it's as simple as that. We are talking about the future of the humanity and of the next generation that have to be mm. included into the conversation. No? Uh, I start when I was uh, nine years. Right now, I'm 14 years old. And when I was nine years, I, I'm from Colombia, uh, to let it clear. Colombia is the second uh, most bio biodiverse country in the world. No? Uh, Latin Americans have around the 40% of the biodiversity of the whole world. So uh, I think that growing up in that uh, context, in that background, full of nature, with a really beautiful uh, view uh, of the mountains, of the nature, of the biodiversity, was how, what, what allow, allowed me to be here, yeah. You, you were talking about uh, that, that children are, no, are, are also the solution, no? They are not just the victims of the problem, they mm -hmm. also can mm -hmm. contribute to the uh, solutions and to make them, no? Uh, and also about the importance of uh, get close the children to the nature, yeah? Uh, uh, Socrates uh, say that the children uh, are the best uh, people to to think, to reflect. Yeah, I don't know how to say philosopher. Uh, fa fa uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, you understand it, mm. no? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, you yeah. got it. Mm -hmm. Phil philosophize, that's it. Mm -hmm. yes. Philosophize. Philosophy. We are yeah. the best, uh, following what uh, Socrates said, the best philosophize in the world because we we ask ourselves for everything no and for and that's the reason because education is as important as it is because uh, the education can uh, precisely get close ourselves to the nature mm -hmm. and can like make us conscious about the problem and also about the solutions and the importance that we uh, have the important role that we have in the context uh, and framework uh, of, cl of fighting for climate change. No? And also regarding the second question, I think that what the governments have to ensure is, um, first of all, education, no? that uh, children have access to a real uh, qualified and um, great education system no? that also includes uh, the climate and environmental context, no? uh, education that allows children to, 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 to participate, no? yeah. a participative yeah. education uh, that includes uh, the, the problems of the territories and of the cities. No? Um, also, I think that is so important, for example, in regions as mine, in, as Latin American and Caribbean region, to guarantee the, the, um, the rights of participation and uh, freedom of expression, because maybe as you know, the uh, insecurity that there is for a uh, human rights defender, it's uh, so high, no? So if we want that young people participate, how how they are gonna to participate if it is genderless, no? So first let's uh, guarantee that they have the tools and the platform to participate and to uh, give their opinions and include them into the uh, policy making. No? And finally, create the mechanism, uh, the effective mechanism to include what children uh, think in, into policies, but also justice, for example, uh, have access to justice, guarantee yeah. that to children, it's so important too. So I don't want to extend uh, more my, my, my words, but I want to thank you and invite you to continue uh, fighting for children. The, f the children are not just, are, are not the future, they, but also they are the present. Mm -hmm. And we are here, please, here to us. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you so much, Francisco. Nothing without us, yes. as the young yes. people. And thank you for talking about the children's rights um, as well that governments have actually committed to. Mm. But I've 
I think my dream is to have thousands and millions like you, Francisco, that can truly become the army of green champions that we need to change the world and, and protect the planet. So thank you, Francisco. So thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our distinguished panels uh, and the commitments that you have all shared. And we will shift into uh, the next um, channel. If I could call uh, Miss Rebecca Chandler to come up to the stage. Um, Dr. Rebecca Chandler, uh, she's the Chief Executive um, um, Officer of the World Reader. And I think as we heard earlier, technology, it is the era of technology, but we have not really leveraged technology. And we also know that in many developing countries, uh, especially for the poor and vulnerable children, technology is not accessible. So we're looking forward to hearing about the innovations uh, that you're doing on how digital solutions such as the learning passport of UNICEF and the World Reader offer innovative approaches to support climate literacy. Um, over to you. And if you could um, you. tell us um, you know, <coughs> how you're supporting countries <coughs> to integrate um, climate literacy into parenting, early learning, and education systems to promote climate action from an early age. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Elizabeth. So allow me to extend my gratitude to Dubai Cares for the hospitality here and to UNICEF for organizing this much needed session. Technology has demonstrated it's scalable and it's cost effective to support parents and caregivers in providing access to climate literacy content for their children. Over the last couple months on our World Reader Book Smart platform, the title Cosmic Climate Innovation itself has been read 27,000 times. It's our ability to capture that real-time data that allows educators and even parents to make better decisions um, in how they engage in climate action. We know we're in a learning crisis. We are also in a climate crisis. And it's our children, listening to Francisco, it's our children that often are bearing the biggest burden and it's our job to take action. But we also know education is at the center of human transformation. In our rapidly developing world, right, technology has the power to be a catalyst for change. We are in the age of screens, screens here, screens on our phone, right? We're in the information age, it's powerful. And it's imperative though that we use this technology for good in a way that we can ignite communities to be both dynamic and digital environments for children to learn in, but also out of the classroom. We know it's so important that we can meet parents and caregivers and their children where they are in any situation, and technology has that ability. At World Reader, we put technology at the middle of our center of our mission to get children reading. We've reached and supported over 22 million readers around the world. And I'm particularly excited today that we to announce our partnership with the Learning Passport in order that we can empower parents and caregivers and educators to help children take climate action. I think we can envision the future of technology, that it can provide agency, it can educate, it can enrich the lives of our very young learners. So join me in watching this short video um, about World Reader and the Learning Passport. Thank you and shukran.
Rebecca, that was powerful. We have solutions and we need each other in the true spirit of partnerships. So thank you to the distinguished uh, panelists and uh, to Rebecca for sharing this wonderful innovation and how we can leverage uh, technology and how we can reach millions of children, but also how we can use technology in a safe way and also to promote equity and reach those who are not able uh, to access technology uh, in many of the parts of the world. So I think in closing, and I know I'm trying, we're trying to catch up with time and I will be uh, very brief. I think we're counting on everybody uh, to work together in the spirit of walking the talk of partnership. I think we need to rewire finance, we need to rewire technology, uh, we need to make sure that the investments are reaching for th those who need it most and especially the growing number of children in emergencies and also affected by climate change. Uh, let's also walk the talk of working together uh, in the spirit of partnerships to solve complex and global problems because no one organization and no one solution will actually address the issues of protecting our planet. Um, I just want to say that um, as we move from the international agreements and negotiations to country action plans, we must ensure that the needs of young children serve as the foundation in which climate smart strategies, policies and financing models are built on. Because it is the younger generation and as we heard from San Francisco, that will carry the burden of the impacts of climate change. And as we talk intergenerational justice, social justice, we must keep this in mind that children are part of that solution. And we must do more as we, uh, we protect our future and we are counting on all your leadership. Thank you so much for attending this session. Thank you. <laughs>